Good morning, everyone. Um, actually, it's a privilege for me to uh, spend some time talking to the future generation. And I'd like to point out to the third uh, statement here. Education is not filling a pail of water or some container, but it's the kindling of a fire. Here we have a group of uh, young, enthusiastic, the most intelligent group, perhaps in Sri Lanka, because you have done so brilliantly well at your A-levels, and you are the future. So don't take everything I say as gospel truth. Please uh, This is just the present status I'm going to talk about. The future is in your hands. You have to take everything I say critically, not as possible to critically, and look at the future opportunities. That is how science grows. If I by hearted and believed everything my teacher said, I would not have contributed anything to science. So every individual has the opportunity to look for something new. That's how scientists do this, okay? With that little introduction, I'll get on to my topic. And uh, it is on biodiversity and how we, how we use the fertilization. Now let's, like all scientists, for our convenience, we start off with a definition. That's simply for convenience. We'll do it. Now I borrowed the, con the, the definition of the Food and Agricultural Organization published in 1989. And what does that say? Uh, biodiversity can be defined as the variety of living forms and their various living <coughs> species, the genetic diversity they contain, and the ecological roles they perform. So basically, this statement includes three aspects. Species diversity, genetic diversity, ecosystem diversity. So essentially, the definition includes that. And we will take these aspects one by one. Now, species diversity. What has been reported and recorded is that in this living world, today we have 1.75 to 1.8 million species of organisms, including microbes. And among these, 56%, more than half of the species are insects and arthropods. In fact, some naturalists have predicted that someday they might take over biosphere. They might take over the world because they are so vast, so numerous in their number of species. That's the insects and the arthropods. Then 14% plants, 3% vertebrates. Now this number refers to those species that have been described, identified and recorded and their specimens deposited in world collections. That does not mean that we have covered all the species living in this world. We may have missed a lot more. There may be many more which we have not been able to identify. We have not been able to take specimens and, and submit them for jumper. In fact, that is the situation. Most biologists don't believe in this figure of uh, 1.5. In fact, they say it's a gross understatement. Because, we take a simple example. We have 56 percent of 1.8 million, that's nearly 1 million, 946,000 species of insects. You squeeze each one of these insects and take an extract and put it on a plate. How many bacterial colonies will you get? You know that we ourselves carry more bacterial cells than all the cells in our bodies. 
the bacterial cells within you and I are more in number than the, all the cells we have in our body. So if we squeeze these insects, how many bacteria from this will be? So definitely this is an underestimate. Why is this? Because particularly with dealing with microorganisms, bacteria, fungi, viruses and so on, we are unable to culture them. We are up to date with all the different media, all the expertise, all the methodology. We cannot culture certain microorganisms in labs. And without culturing them, we can't characterize them, we can't identify them, we can't deposit them. So that itself shows that this is an underestimate. And the real estimates are supposed to be anything between 5 to 100 million species. That itself shows that how ignorant we are. So here you have an entire world of discovery for the future. You can only discover a new species, maybe from Sri Lanka. That's an area for your work. Now, in addition to these numbers, we have a, a range of diversity among these species. When we talk of species diversity, they will be different, they will, be, they will show variation in size, lifespan, form, nutrition, reproduction, life cycle, such as. All these aspects shall be ranges of variation. I'll take a little bit of time to, uh, to talk about this diversity. Size. Starting from the minute, which we cannot see with our naked eye, bacteria, we end up with huge trees. Trees that are 300, 400 feet tall. Massive trees. That's so biomass variation extends from a minuscule micro bacterium to a huge tree. Among the animals, you have the protozoan, which cannot, you cannot see with the naked eye to the huge whales. That's the size range. And the lifespan, a bacterium under the best culture conditions can multiply every 20 minutes. Every 20 minutes it can produce a new generation. So it's so rapid. On the other hand, certain trees grow for thousands of years. It's good to remember that among the trees, tree species, with a historical background, this small country, Sri Lanka, this small island, has the oldest tree in the world, and that is Sri Mahabodhi. With a recorded history, there are, of course, what are called giant redwoods in the northern hemisphere, extending from North America to Russia, which have been calculated to be older than 3,000, 3,500 years by cutting them and counting the annual rings. But with a recorded history, this our country and that's recorded in international publications as the oldest tree in the world, Sri Mahaprabhu. Good to remember. Then, that is lifespan. Form. Again, you start with unicellular bacteria, mycelial fungi, colonial types of algae and bacteria, then the filamentous types, the differentiated filaments, false branching filaments, true branching filaments, <coughs> tissues, parenchyma, colonchyma, sclerenchyma, different tissue formation, then organelles, organs, organisms, and very wide variety. That's, obvious. That's the most obvious thing when you look around, you step out, you see trees of different size, animals of different size and shape and color and all that. So that is form. Then nutrition. Even in nutrition, okay, most of the organisms that we are familiar with are green in color, they have chlorophyll, they are porcine. They synthesize their own food using the energy from the light. But there are other bacteria that are chemosynthetic. Here again they use energy from chem chemical reactions to synthesize them. Then you have saprophytes, parasites, uh, symbionts, they are all heterotrophic. That is, they obtain their food from other organic matter and other living organisms. 
So, and among the heterotrophs, you have obligate, that means they will only derive food from other organisms. They are facultative ones, which are occasionally drawing food like that. So you have a very wide range of, even in obtaining nutrition. Reproduction. The basic way we are, we, we all are familiar with even with your whole level knowledge, vegetative reproduction, asexual reproduction, sexual reproduction. We have divided three categories. Vegetative means any vegetative normal part can be produce a new. That's very common among plants. You cut a hibiscus branch and plant it in the soil, you get a new. Or you cut a earthworm into two, each piece can give, develop into a new world. That's normal vegetative part. But you, if you cut your hand and plant it, it won't produce a human. So certain species of animals, as well as plants, can produce vegetative. That is a normal vegetative part. And on the other hand, asexual reproduction means slightly different from vegetative, but that reproduction is through specific units. They are adapted to reproduction, like the spores, the asexual spores of aspergillus, penicillin, or the spores of chlamydomonas. So they are, they are, they are, that job of that unit is to produce a new generation. That is asexual, but without uniting with each other. No union. That is asexual. Sexual reproduction of the hand means they always, there's a union between two units, two reproductive units, join and form a new generation. So that is the variation in reproduction, vegetative, asexual, and sexual. Then among that, you have what are calling simple flow, uh, swimming types like chlamydomonas, isogamy, where the two reproductive units that they, that join are similar, or oh, an isogamy, where they are different. One is larger than the other one. Normally, the female reproductive unit is larger than the male reproductive unit, even among humans. The ovum is very much bigger than the sperm. Then among reproduction, you have isogamy and isogamy, and then you have specialized reproductive structures, and so on, and wide variation. You take the life cycles. The life cycles also show variations. You have what are called haplontic life cycles. And I believe you are aware of what's called chromosome number N, 2N, and so on. When the chromosome number of a life cycle, majority of the life cycle is, remains as N, these are the case with simple organisms, the more primitive organisms. They are called haploid, and therefore the life cycle is called haplontic. In a haplontic life cycle, only the cycle, after the union of the two units, you get a two end situation. Then the two gametes fuse, end and end becomes two end. Only that, only the cygote remains two end. The first division of the right cygote itself is meiotic or reduction division giving rise to again N or haploid gamete. So only that zygote state is 2N in a haplontic life cycle. Then the opposite is the diplontic life cycle. In a diplontic life cycle, all the stages of a life cycle are diploid, 2N, except the gametes. And the production of the gametes or gametangial mother cells divide by meiosis or reduction division to give you N or haploid gametes. And they, when they fuse, they become diploid and from there on the entire life cycle is diploid. So that's the diplontic life cycle. So on the one hand, we have haplontic life cycle, diplontic. Then there are a lot of other organisms, including plants, animals, where both cycles are there. One part is diplontic, other part, part of the life cycle is haplontic. A, similar, a simple example is Martensia or Pogonot. I don't think you have done those yet. Maybe a day or two doing them. Uh, where one part of the life cycle is diploid, other part is haploid. So those are called diplohaplontic. It's very easy to remember. We have haplontic, diplontic, diplohaplontic. Okay? And 
they are also complicated life cycles. Some are certain algae, not very common, which can have three phases. Some of them are diplo diplo haplotic, others are haplo haplo diplotic. Now, once you get familiar with this term, haplo means one or n, diplo means two n. You can have all these. So, all these variations are depicted among the diversity of species in reproduction and life cycles. Habitats, of course, you know that organisms grow in different, different habitats and we deal with that in ecosystem life. Okay, so now you see, besides the large number, how much of diversity we have. One thing to remember, among all living organisms, it is the plants or the trees that are the biggest in biomass as well as the longest living. I'm not saying this because I'm the professor of botany, but that is the situation. As I said, no animal live, will live for thousands of years. And no animal will be three, four hundred feet tall. So the biggest and the longest living organisms among this variety are the trees. I'll just illustrate that with the next slide. Now this is a giant redwood tree, which is found even today. They are living in the northern hemisphere, as I said, California. This tree is 342 feet tall. I could take only part of the photograph. You see in the next slide in comparison, that's me and my wife at the bottom of that tree. You can see the size of what? I'm about five and a half feet tall. That and that, this is the span of the tree. giant redwood tree, it's enormously big, which of course we don't get in the topics. Okay. Now we move on to the other one, the genetic diversity. Now how come all what I spent the last maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes describing about the species number, the diversity they show in all aspects, what is the basis? Why are they different? Basis is this the genes that these organisms contain. And this has taken a long, long time. That's 3.8 billion years. They all started among undifferentiated single cell microorganisms. Life started. Even life started even before that, you know, a biological chemical evolution moved to the formation of DNA, the first molecule that could replicate itself, that is considered as the beginning of life, self ability to self-replicate, and then evolution took place from there onwards for 3.8 billion years. And that is the germ plasma, that is the dowry we have got from nature. And these genes are in the form of nucleotides, they combine and form deoxid, ribonucleic acid, or RNA or DNA. They are separate because it is the first sort of property of life. And then you have the genes in the more advanced form, you have chromosomes, supramolecules, chromosomal genes, as well as the more advanced ones like the eukaryotic nucleated organisms have plasmids, chloroplasts, mitochondria, and so on. They themselves contain genes in addition to the nuclear genes. Of course, in the prokaryotic organisms like bacteria and cyanobacteria, there are no nuclei and plasmids. So we have, in the slightly more advanced forms, from the eukaryotic algae to the large trees and animals, you have the Chromosomal and the plasma, and together they are called the genome, the total genetic. Then you have embedded this in the nucleus, in the nuclear material, and finally enclosed in organisms. So the gene pool 
is contained this huge gene pool which has evolved over 3.8 billion years is contained in the organism. So we have to protect the organisms in order to protect the gene pool. Now I will take a few minutes to go back to the film clip that you saw on the opening day. You remember a short film that was shown on biomimicry? How much we are, we are learning our technology, developing technology looking at biological organisms? The cockroach, the dragonfly, the gecko, and those plants with, which are uh, having those propagules sticking on to animals, elastic things and all that. So that is the value. That is why we have to protect these little creatures, which appear to be of no use, which are in fact a nuisance. When you see a cockroach, you are crush it. That's what you, you have instinctive that. But no, they contain important genes. They contain important uh, uh, behavior patterns that we can make use of. So don't kill these animals from today. Hmm? Then we move on to the ecological the ecosystem. Now these living organisms I talked about don't live, they of course exist as individuals, but they always interact with one another. They can't live all alone, even human beings. We interact with one another and they are dependent upon each other as well as on the non-living environment. You have the living organisms in a non-living environment, they even we have to interact with the non-living environment. And together we call it the ecosystem. Ecosystem therefore is the living organisms as well as the non-living environment they live in. It's the ecosystem. And that again is you have the individuals, they don't live alone, they live as families, birds, groups, populations, communities, so what is the difference here? Say take a tree, you have a population of crows which come and perch there. At the same time you have some other birds also on that tree. So taken together the tree has a community of different populations. So that's a community. Then they are ecosystem and of course the biomes, the belt, Arctic, Antarctic, the subtropical belts, biomes, and the entire living sphere, biosphere, as different from the atmosphere and the lithosphere. Okay, so that is how the ecosystems exist. And in regard to ecosystem, diversity of Sri Lanka, being a small island, we have these major ecosystems that we can identify, the coastal and marine littoral vegetation, that is the thing that is paid by the sea water, the marine algae, and so on, and then the seashore vegetation, the creeping vegetation on the sand, like Ipomia piscatri, Spinifex rotundus, those are the common ones which are creeping and show sort of xerophytic characters because they have to withstand the salt spray, the hot sun, and the hot sand, all that. Then the, as you come in from the shoreline, you get the tropical thorny vegetation, as you find in Kalpitya, Puttalam, or Hampantota, the thorny vegetation, as you move in, the uh, familiar things would be uh, um, spinifex and, uh, and small grasses, of course the coconut trees are there, calotropis, uh, species like that, mostly thorny plants, and Prosophis uh, junipora, which is very thorny. And then, together with the thorns and glands, we have the lagoons and mangroves, which are special vegetation. These are the uh, ecosystem that we see in Sri Lanka. Then, as you move in, you get the tropical, dry, mixed, evergreen forests. Evergreen means they don't shed their leaves, but they are Dry, uh, most of your dry areas, uh, or down south is Maharama, uh, Hambantota, they have the dry mixed evergreen forest, but disturbed because human beings are going and build houses, floors, and they are cultivating and so on. Yesterday, you spent time at Damula on a dry mixed evergreen forest that has been restored to full capacity. Now that is an undisturbed, that's why it's called an operator. You saw the difference. 
even within the amula itself, when you go into the Papam Arboretum, you see a very well grown forest with a lot of trees, but as you step out across the road, you see the dry mixed evergreen forest that is disturbed. So a mixed evergreen forest or dry sown forest has a discontinuous channel. That's one of the characters. Discontinuous means that uh, the top canopy is, uh, the trees are farther from. In other words, uh, the, even the monkeys can't continuously jump from one tree to another. That's different from Singhalaj. Or knuckles. They are, they are so close canopy. Where the canopy is close to each other, the monkey can move from on top without getting down to the ground. But that can be done. And the trees are generally shorter than in a rain. So those are the little little characters between uh, dry mixed evergreen forest and drop wet evergreen rainforest that you see particularly Singharaja and also Knuckles. And then the tropical mountain forest, the peak wilderness, that is the Sripad area, that's the mountain, sub-mountain, then the mountain forests are important plains, which are characteristic for the cool climate and the uh, uh, very sort of strong winds across the peaks, and that is why the trees in Horton Place, if you have, some of you have gone, or when you go, you will see, they don't grow into tall trees, they can't. Because of the cold, as well as the, the strong winds, they fall. They have, the, the branches are all sort of warped and wrapped around, spiral, that's called the gnarled appearance. And uh, then you have, of course, the specialized vegetation like the river ride, along the rivers, river rhine vegetation, and ponds and reservoirs, wetlands, including paddy fields, artificially created wetlands, but still they are wetlands. Now the river rhine vegetation, I like to mention something important, and when the next lecturer, Dr. Sarah Tamarasi, talks to you on water quality, you will realize how important they are. Now, most of our rivers or canals, they bring water to the reservoirs. Like Muraraba, Tisarava, Basava Kulama, Kundua uh, Tuana tank, whatever tanks, they are wind feeding rivers and canals. Now, if they don't, they, can, they may not have vegetation if they are completely clear, but the river line vegetation is the vegetation that you get along the banks of In ancient times, our ancient kings, when we had the irrigated agriculture, even at that time, the ancient civilization, these feeding in canals to the reservoirs were bent. And the, the, the kings or the culture had left it like the shape of a, of a snake. And why? When the British colonized us and came, they said these stupid natives, what the hell they have made this come like this, straighten them and concrete them so that there would be a very smooth flow of water. But it was not the natives who were stupid, the British were stupid. Because today, all the pollution from the hill country due to fertil excess fertilizer use, is of Saratamsi will stress, and all the nutrients, they just come flowing down along the concrete canals and accumulate in the reservoirs pollute the reservoirs, causing kidney diseases, causing cancer, and producing algal blooms. All the nutrients come without any hindrance. But when the feeding in canal is wavy at each bend, there is a slowing down of the flow. As well as, not only were they curved, they grew reeds, punk, various grasses at each bend. And that absorb the nutrients as well as retain the particles that are coming from top. It's soil erosion. It, most nutrients come into a reservoir particle bound, bound to particles, attached to particles. So the kings were so, our ancient civilization was so wise to have the bends and also plant. That is what is called river rhine vegetation. And today, research has shown that when you re-establish river line vegetation, your pollution becomes less and less. Now that is another area where you young people, when we are gone, your turn will come, establish the river line vegetation and see that the pollution becomes is minimized. 
Now, when you talk of ecosystem diversity, there are certain terms that you have to get familiar with. Flagship species. What is this? In fact, a few years back, a terrible question was, what is a flagship species? I don't know about the Tamil translation. Unfortunately, the Sinhala translation is written this way. Flagship species in Sinhala is called Dajadari species. Dajadari. So a large number of students wrote the flagship species of Sri Lanka is the lion. Because Dajadari is a The flagship species is not what is in the flag, but what is culturally affiliated to a nation. So our flagship species is the elephant. The flagship species of Bangladesh is the Bengal tiger. Flagship species of USA is a hawk, which they have in their insignia. So flagship species is not what is in the flag, but what is culturally affiliated to a nation. Okay? Then that is of course culture, but this is more important. Keystone species. Different ecosystems have one or a few, it need not be one, one or few species that contributes to the stability of that ecosystem. If that species gets extinct or removed, the entire ecosystem will collapse. So you should be aware of the, the keystone species. And for instance, among the brown algae, the giant kelps of the Pacific Ocean is considered a keystone. Now these giant caves you will learn only when from the university can be as long as 150 feet. So there are algae, and they are not always small. 150 feet they can, giant caves they are called. If they are destroyed, the entire ocean ecosystem in that area could be could be could collapse. Similarly in the corals. The corals are keystone species, living corals are keystone species. And we are now destroying them. Uh, and that could collapse the entire ecosystem, including the barriers. Then the other thing is the important aspect of endemic species. Species that are confined to a particular area, or a country, or a region. Because that is a germplasm that is restricted. It is kind of, has to be protected because if that vanishes, that germplasm or that gene pool will be lost forever for humans. So that is why endemic species are also important. Ecosystem services. Now we are talking about ecosystem diversity, ecosystems, species, and now they, they render services which we take for granted. Pollination, air and water purification. We get pure air, pure water because of ecosystems. Hydrological cycle, the rainfall pattern. Erosion and flood control, if you renew the vegetation, you, you get severe erosion and floods. Cycling of nutrients, the activity of all the micro cancers in the ecosystem to regenerate the nutrients, to continue life. And then, of course, the recreational value, when you go to you went to Arboretum yesterday, you would have had a nice feeling of being inside that forest. And recreational purposes, the clear waters, few waters, the nice waterfalls. So all these services we have taken for granted. We don't consider them of value. Then we see a nice car, oh, oh, that's nice. But when you see a, a lovely bird, we don't give any value. But some scientists have value this. It's an estimate. You cannot really value like a commodity, but it's an estimate. And they have value. This is a scientific publication coming from the Smithsonian Institute of America. The job that the microorganisms are doing by cycling nutrients has been valued to be equivalent to $33 billion a year, much more than our Sri Lankan budget. They are, this is the value they are contributing, we have taken it for granted. Value of insect pollination, $30 billion. Drugs from plants, and this is the list. These are all estimates, but we are not just guesstimates, but estimates based upon scientific information and data. And the global estimate by Constanza Ettel is a classical paper in the journal Nature. Nature is the 
most prestigious journal among all scientific journals, 1997. This paper has 18 authors. 18 scientists have contributed to this from all over the world. And they say the total estimate of ecosystem services value that 33 trillion dollars, not billion, that's thousand billion. 33 trillion dollars, and that is twice that of all goods and services man is producing today. All our manufacturing goods from cars to ships and everything, oil, all that, plus the food, plus the services, including satellite services, the ecosystem services are twice the value of all what we are producing. So important contribution by nature. Now we move on to use of biodiversity. This lecture is biodiversity and its utilization. When we talk of biodiversity, when they are to be used as a as a resource, then we call them bio resource or better bio wealth. Because now we know that they have a value. It's a bio wealth. We are using nature's wealth. And that is the attitude we should. We should not consider them as just available and use it arbitrarily. There's a bio wealth has to be used carefully, just as much as you use your money carefully. Now these are the different uses, agriculture, food production, animal production, floriculture, forestry and lumber, microorganisms, microbial products, materials for pharmaceuticals. Now the new area of molecular biology and genetic engineering, therefore the organism to gene pool has become extremely important. And this is the problem. In increasing human population obviously imposes tremendous pressure on this bio -wave. So one has to be always alert that this is a well, it has to be used carefully and sustained so that it continues. Don't destroy it. Those of global use of Earth's resources, this well, highly unequal because, you see, now the developed countries are telling us how to use it, but they are using 20% of the world population amount. One thing uses 80% of the energy and 80% of the economy. But they are also teaching us how to use it. They are exploiting it. So there is a loss, unequal distribution. And in the Smithsonian publication where they valued the bioresources, there is a final statement which says, if everyone wants to enjoy the standard of living of an average U.S. citizen, citizen of, a, of U.S. United States, it would require four more planet Earths to support the world population. And so if everyone wants to emulate the U.S. living, with so much of waste, so much of the utilization of energy and resources, we will need four more planets. This planet Earth won't be enough. So we have to be aware of this. But what is happening today? Sri Lankans, Indians, Burmese, Chinese, they all want to emulate the, Russia, the Americans. They want to have five cars and huge mansions, enormous shopping malls. That's, we have to have a, a, a logical look at this and see whether it can be sustained. The entire world would collapse. In fact, certain uh, naturalists have called this the word Anthropocene. We are familiar with geological epochs called Miocene. Anthropocene means anthropology, means human activity. And they say Anthropocene is going to collapse the world, to destroy the world. We might become extinct if we go on like this. So we have to be careful, we have to change our living styles. And that is how it is recorded. Five mass extincts have been recorded so far from the time the Earth evolved. And the sixth extinction has been predicted due to man himself, due to anthropocene. If man goes on like this, this could happen. And there, these are not just arbitrary statements. See how people's behavior has led to extinction. Mediterranean sea islands, all large mammal species have been destroyed. 
after man colonized those sites. West Indies, endemic stocks, monkeys, toads, and snakes, none of them are known. They have all been destroyed. Madagascar, 24 species of mammals, birds, and tortoises have been destroyed. Hawaii, 66% of all vertebrates, 90% of all the land birds have been destroyed after the people colonized. New Zealand, fox, lizards, bird species of birds. So, as I said, this extinction prediction is not arbitrary. It's happening. If people are not aware and they don't change their lifestyles, we could destroy ourselves. Consequences of over-exploitation or so environmental degradation. I mean, now, of course, even in this country, we have these highways. I don't say they are not necessary. They are needed. But they have to be done with proper planning and the minimum impact on the environment as well. Production of waste material, so much of waste. And our country is comparatively better compared to the other countries. Now we are aware of global warming, acid rain, rising sea level. These were predicted years ago, but people didn't take notice of it. Now there are some sort of recognition, still people don't agree. Damage to the ozone layer. And that is the protective layer which protects us from ultraviolet radiation. And today it's, it's, it's been shown even in the health services. Why are these different types of flus? Bird flu, uh, this flu, that flu that the doctors are baffled with because the radiation mutates the viruses and microorganisms so rapidly. When you apply some drugs or find a cure, another generation has started because mutation is very rapid due to excess. UV radiation that we are getting. Reduction of biodiversity and increase of India. So one should resolve that all resources should be used carefully and sustainably, that they continue, they, we don't destroy resources. These are the examples from the United States of America, so-called most developed country in the world. Original American tall grass, 99% transplant. Original primary forest, 95% lost. We talk savanna, 98% altered. Old growth forest in the Pacific North, those are the redwoods, 90% clear. Wild scenic rivers, 90 to 98% degraded. Coastal shrub, 72 to 90% disturbed. This was the price America had paid for so-called development. Do we want to go the same thing? Think about it. Then, of course, the last one is not quite clear seen here. Uh, original wetlands, 50%. Why on these at 90 and the lowest mark for wetlands? Because America finally decided to protect the Florida Everglades wetlands. And Florida Everglades wetland is twice the size of Sri Lanka. It's a huge area. Therefore, they have got 50% protection there. Why are we going to protect this biodiversity? I already touched upon the mimicry field. We can learn from biodiversity and develop technology. In addition, the African crow frog, it's a very interesting story. The Chinese, uh, the Africans, Tribes had a habit, when you had eczema and wounds that cannot be cured, they used to go to the forest and reflect using small mirrors, reflect light on to frogs. A particular type of frog, the broad frog. These frogs, amphibians, they are innocent animals. They don't have teeth. They have no defense. The only defense they have is to secrete some poisonous material through their skins. If you now from tomorrow, if you go and observe a toad or a frog, you see there are bumps on its skin. Those are secretory glands. And that is why cats and dogs don't eat frogs or toads. When they go, they start secreting that poison and that gives a reflection to the cat or the dog. Oh, this is uh, dangerous. And the African tribes used to take these secretions and apply them on the wounds and the wounds heal. Then, Scientists from developed countries did a lot of research and came out with the 
completely new group of antibiotics, very effective antibiotics to heal wounds. And they were called, they are called Magarin. And they formed a company in the Tikkun period. Now in Sri Lanka, we have 32 species of endemic amphibians. Endemic amphibians, amphibians that are only present in Sri Lanka. But we have not looked at them. Secretions. And maybe a whole lot of medicine there, stored for us to do research. So that's again up to you all for the future. Okay? Then there are other things like from the dogfish, you got solamine, that's all this uh, uh, drug that is commonly now used for cancer, wing cancer tree, this is from wing carbosia, it used to be now called catalanthus sources, minimal, only common even in Sri Lanka. So natural product chemistry is constantly searching for new chemicals. We have a natural products chemistry division even in the IFS. Our scientists are looking for new, more and more things from nature. And, and try to, then we don't just extract and use them. We use them as models and develop synthetic drugs from their models. And marine environment and tropical rainforest is supposed to have a lot of new products yet to be discovered. That is why we have to protect them. Access to genetic. Now we come to a bit of commercialization and interaction among nations. The Biodiversity Convention says because of this situation, higher biodiversity is mostly found in the developing countries' tropical well, while modern techniques for their utilization and availability and patent to that in developed countries. And therefore, it is necessary to be vigilant against biopirates. That's why we get newspaper articles once in a way. Some foreigner has been caught at the customs carrying some of our uh, toads or frogs or some other animals, turtles and so on, or a small piece of plant. Because they take these things to look at their genes and then develop drugs and then patent them and make money. But that is a storehouse of wealth. As I said, so throughout the web, humanity must use it, but use it with, under these conditions. This is the International Biodiversity Convention, which says prior informed, lay down three conditions to use the utilization, prior informed consent, mutual agreed terms, equitable distribution of this benefits. When the British came and colonized us in 1815, and then took over our land, they never asked the Sri Lankans to, that we are going to cut your grain for us and put tea or rubber or cotton. Plantations were established without prior informed consent. You can't do that now. After this convention, there are 156 countries that have signed. If somebody is going to use the bio wealth of a country, animal or plant or microbial, you have to explain to the local population, this is your well, this is what we are going to do, this is what you are going to get out of this. And then get the consent. Prior, inform, not just the consent, you have to inform and get the consent. That is the condition one. Condition two is that both parties should agree, mutually agree to the terms of how to utilize. Third one is you must ensure during that agreement mutual equitable distribution of benefits. One cannot grab the wealth and use it and make money, should be equitably distributed. So the convention has laid down these things. And we can work within this framework, utilize the bio wealth and okay. So it cannot be arbitrarily used. And we should not be scared. The group even in Sri Lanka, which is scared, is don't touch them. Don't touch biodiversity. Don't look at them. That is also. It's like, uh, like the blind man not knowing the value of the, the huge gemstone he had as a door stone until it broke. So he didn't know the thing. We must utilize the wealth, but carefully and sustainably so that everybody gets benefit and we don't destroy the natural resource as well. Now, impacts of development in Sri Lanka. Today we have enormous development. I just glanced through this because this is our own experience. 
And Dr. Amarasili, I'm sure, is going to emphasize on water quality and uh, enlighten you on that. Now, water pollution is a result of human activity. And this can be illustrated very well in looking at our own reservoirs over the years. If a water body is generally pure, it will have algae. Water is there, sunlight is there, photosynthetic algae will be there. But the numbers will be relatively small, not a bloom. At the same time, the variety, the diversity will be more. We have green algae, blue green algae, diatoms, whole works. Right? Variety is small now. Once it gets polluted, most of the sensitive algae will disappear. And the tough fellows will multiply themselves and become blooms. And that is what we have to look for. So if there are a large population with few species, that means the water is polluted. Because only a few species will be able to withstand the effects of pollution, remain and they outnumber the others. And very often these are the top blue green algae which produce toxins. So with that background, let's look at what has happened. In 1907, these are published literature. When the British looked at our algae, nine reservoirs, they found populations were small, diversity high, and very few blue green algae. They were all non-toxigenic. They don't produce non the non-toxic algae. By 1950, we all were familiar with the Bayer Lake in Colombo becoming green coming and the bloom was a toxin producing alga called microcystis. It's a toxin. Then we ourselves monitored 11 reservoirs, typically from the Andhra area, had nine toxin producing, out of the 11 reservoirs, nine had toxin producing. Only these two, Labugama and Palatuava, which provides water to Kalambu, did not have them because they had protected catchment area. Then by 2004, Unichai tank had the huge bloom of cylindrous form of cis and necrosis. This is the most predominant toxin producing algae in Sri Lanka today. Again, by 2008, we monitored the cascade of tanks from Srinagar Samutra to Konduvatuano, Aligalge, Hindudurava, Konduvatuano. All Srinagar tank had very little algae, it was pure water. When we move from there to Konduatuana tank in Ampare, predominant population of silver, as much as 15,000 units of silver sperm is per milliliter of water. Then the latest 2012, just last year, 61 reservoirs have been surveyed and predominance of, so essentially, and for the first time, it was in Uralia, Gregory Lake had silver sperm. So, in the name of pollution, obvious that our water bodies have got polluted. And the indication is that from non-toxigenic algae, they are now today a predominance of toxigenic algae. Development is necessary, should harmonize with environment of protection and biodiversity conservation. So we have to have development but in consideration. Attention should be paid to sustainable utilization. Sustainable, sustainable. We should not destroy our biology. We must utilize it carefully and sustainable. And we as human beings, of course, call ourselves the most intelligent species among all human beings. And therefore we claim for leadership. If we are the leaders, we should be benevolent. Human species should earn its leadership position among the Earth's living, Earth's living organisms if we are claiming to be the leaders by playing a more benevolent role towards others, so-called less intelligent beings. I think this is the message conveyed by all religions. We should not destroy life. We should not destroy our planet. Thank you.